Rahman Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and a very warm welcome to World This Morning. I'm your host, Hajra Sati, and unfortunately, I couldn't be joined by my co host because he has some engaging commitment to attend to. Um, okay, so I had a lovely friend yesterday in the studio and we were talking about the university days, and I was reminiscing about a lot of things with her, uh, certainly good times. Um, and I did came across, you know, some thinking, and um, I, you know, wanted to venture into the philosophy, but I couldn't because, you know, it's not an easy pie to grapple. Right. Um, so one of my friend and I would like to take her name here, Sherbano Zafar. <coughs> she told me that go for the easy philosophy and then, you know, make your mind a fertile ground to absorb the higher philosophy. Uh, so she recommended <coughs> me a book. Um, it's called Meditation by Marcus Ornelius, who happened to be a Greek emperor. Um, and he had a very, you know, sort of difficult life being an emperor because he had some, you know, physical bodily defects, which he couldn't do much about it. So he wrote pieces of advice for himself which were later compiled into a book called meditations um, and it's a lovely read so you know it's Juma so I really wanted to share some of the quotes with you guys because you know they always help me out uh, whenever you know I'm stressful about it um, so uh, whenever you are about to find a fault with someone ask yourself the following question what fault of mine mostly nearly resembles the one that I am about to criticize. Um, I think that's a wonderful piece of advice considering the fact that, you know, we all make mistakes um, and, you know, empathizing with the people who are committing mistakes and, you know, understanding from where they are coming from um, can, you know, help you a lot in correcting their flaws when it comes to that. Um, second piece of advice. So when you wake up in the morning, tell yourself the people I deal with today will be meddling, ungrateful, arrogant, dishonest, jealous and surly. They are like this because they can't tell good from the evil. But I have seen the beauty of goodness and the ugliness of the evil um, and have recognized that wrongdoers have a nature related to my own, not by the same blood of birth, but by the same mind and possessing a share of the divine. Um, right. So this is some, you know, very beautiful advice that, you know, I came across and I really wanted to share with that. Uh, and now, you know, we are moving on to the favorite segment of mine, which is about the news. And certainly when we are talking about the news, the so situation is not so very good in the country, considering the fact that um, as this term was coined by our uh, climate change minister, Mirish Ms. Shehri Rahman, about monsoon monsters, um, you know, very monsterly rain that we are having. Um, so moving on to our first segment of the news which is about the flood situation. Um, so torrential rains and flooding have caused a humanitarian crisis in Pakistan as over 900 people have died and hundreds other injured. 30 million people have been affected across the country as it sees its eighth cycle of monsoon rains. Most of the casualties occur in Sin and Balochistan. Thousands have no shelter and food due to this humanitarian disaster while more than 504,000 livestock have been killed, nearly all of them in Balochistan. Pakistan Army, Pakistan Navy, Civil Administration are utilizing all the resources to help flood victims. Authorities have also appealed for international funding for flood relief, rehabilitation and the reconstruction of damaged infrastructure. Um, certainly, you know, I wouldn't deny that this is a hard time on Pakistan because we have seen such sort of intense rain, you know, um, with no respite, even for a day or half a day, you know. And I do feel that our cities are not designed for such si sort of, you know, climate resilient, um, and, you know, nature of the rain where they can absorb this amount of water. Um, moving on to our second aspect of the news, which is also related to the flooding. Um, Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif Saab have ordered immediate distribution of the cash assistance among the flood affectees, calling an emergency high-level meeting of all the chief ministers of provinces, Azad Jammu and Kashmir Prime Minister and Gilgit Baltistan Chief Minister. He was chairing a meeting on the rescue and relief operation in the aftermath of the situation arising out of the recent rains and floods. The Premier also formed committees for the speedy and orderly assistance to the flood hit victim. The Prime Minister directed the Ministers of Economic Affairs and Finance to come up with a comprehensive strategy to deliver the aid. Announced by the international institutions and organizations during the donor conference, Prime Minister was given a detailed briefing on the facts and figures of the losses in the flood and about the ongoing rescue and relief operations. Right. 
Um, so, you know, this is the sort of the climate, climate catastrophe and we are the ground zero for the climate catastrophe um, and this is very concerning to us because, you know, we have uh, sort of zero or nearly minimal uh, contribution in producing the climate change, yet we are so disproportionately affected by it. Um, moving on to, you know, third parts of, of the news, which is also about Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif Sahab. Um, he has lifted the ban on the departmental sports of Pakistan. Oh wow. The Premier announced while addressing the national athletes who secured medals in the Commonwealth Games 2022 and Islamic Games 2022. The Prime Minister said he is lifting the ban on the departmental sports as it will increase competition. It will provide an opportunity to national male and female athletes to showcase their talents and skills. And he also called on national athletes including Arshad Nadeem and Noor Dastaki, the two managed to bag gold medals for Pakistan in the Commonwealth Games 2022. Pakistan bagged overall eight medals in the Commonwealth Games 2022. And Pakistan also changed its post structure from departmental to regional during the former Prime Minister's tenure. A number of former and current athletes have raised their voices in the favour of the departmental sports ever since the structure was changed. Well, I do feel that, you know, sports is really important um, considering the fact that, you know, nowadays we're always interacting with the social media, with the screen um, and we are hardly into the physical sports and it's very important to have physical sports because, you know, they sort of harness your sportsman-like spirit, the confidence and whatnot. Um, and also, you know, our very lovely host Shazad was also there in the ceremony. He was hosting it um, and, and we really um, miss him and we congratulate him because he you know, was hosting such a lovely ceremony. Um, so, you know, uh, as I was talking about the humanitarian efforts, about the floods, um, you know, so there are a lot of people in this world, you know, who uh, inspire you so much because the kind of the contributions they are uh, doing towards the humanity, towards the humanitarian work and towards the, um, you know, relief of activities that are going on um, inside our country and globally across the world too. Um, and one such organization, you know, which is a faith-based organization called Islamic Relief, you know, that has been helping people across the world and their philosophy is inspired by the Islamic principles of dignity. And I was so inspired, you know, while reading their, you know, prof portfolio profile um, and, you know, that affected me a lot because, you know, the West believes in separating the religion and the politics. Um, and I do believe that, you know, this is one of the reasons why we have a climate change because, you know, you cannot separate Allah from anything. Um, he is the soul, he, his love permeates everything. Um, um, his uh, light permeates everything. Uh, so without any further ado, I would really like to introduce my guest um, who happens to be Mr. Wasim Ahmad. He is CEO Islamic Relief Worldwide and I think he's the only Pakistani to head this organization and we are really proud you know, of the work that he's doing for this organization and for the humanitarian efforts. So I welcome him. Assalamu alaikum and thank you so much for coming Walaikum to my salam. show. Thanks for having me today. Lovely, lovely the activities of the Islamic Relief and the philosophy behind it and because it's a faith-based inspiration organization, right? So, yeah. Yeah, Islamic Relief uh, since 1984 has been Lovely. operating all over the world, over 40 countries. And mm -hmm. as you rightly mentioned, Islamic Relief, our work is inspired from our faith, Islam. Right. And the teaching in Islam about development and looking after uh, communities who are in suffering and really right. helping communities to be on their own. One of the hallmark of our work is right. bringing dignity and just I'll explain dignity in a way that right. we when we work with communities right. we try to give them fishing rod rather than giving them fish. Lovely. Lovely. That's lovely. And, you know, so Pakistan is, is sort of in, in a, you know, it's a, a ground zero for the climate catastrophe. We had, you know, such monster monsoon as of we speak now. This is the eighth cycle um, that is going on. And certainly we are no stranger to monsoon season. You know, we do have it. Um, but I mean, the scale of it this year was so huge when it comes to that. Um, you know, uh, and, and no our such city is geared for such sort of climate resilient, um, you know, water absorption capacity of such a scale, right, sir? Um, so I really wanted to ask you, you know, um, how is Islamic Relief contributing towards, you know, flood affected victims in Pakistan and, and um, you know, what are your activities in, in a Pakistan country? 
As you rightly said, Pakistan is one of the top 10 countries that right. climate change is uh, impacting us a lot. And right. you mentioned in your intro that Islamic right. Relief is working in Pakistan, but one of the fact is that right. we are producing less carbon emission in this country, but we are taking the brunt of uh, the effects right. of the climate, That's unfortunately. Right. One of the work that Islamic Relief is right. doing since 1992, helping right. community to develop their resilience. Right. I think resilience is the key in right. terms of uh, facing this climate change induced right. disasters such as flooding right. and drought is also one of the right. uh, phenomena that we have experienced in this country. Since right. the flood in this Munsi season, Islamic Leaf uh, launched 15 million pound right. program in Balochistan, in KPK, in Sindh and Sandar and Punjab. Right. Uh, our teams are on the ground and Balochistan, KPK and Sindh are providing right. much needed relief uh, efforts and relief items. But one of the things we must right. not forget that we have to prepare communities to rehabilitate their shelter, their livestock, the livestock perish, over a million livestock, the recent figures are coming out and most of them are relying on the livestock. Right. Islamic right. Leaf is right. not only just providing the relief items to save right. lives, but also we are looking into rehabilitating their livelihoods. Winter right. is approaching and Balochistan right. is going to be harsh winter, That's so true. we have to prepare them yes. for the shelter and for right. the health care needs. Right. Uh, I'm proud of my team in Pakistan and right. I welcome Prime Minister initiative about the right. donor conference. Islamic right. Leaf is keen and committed to support this initiative right. globally and the, our all the right. offices in US and Canada, in Europe, in Australia, right. uh, they are working day in and day out to support our communities all across Pakistan right. to help them to come out from this emergency. Right. So, you know, you mentioned that, you know, you guys are into, you know, community building aspect of it. Uh, and you, uh, you know, believe in instead of, you know, giving the fish, you believe in, you know, giving the fishing rod so they can be more sustainable when it comes to that. So do you want to build on to that? And you know, can you elaborate, you know, what sort of capacity building activities Islamic Relief has been participating in Pakistan? I think I'll, I would like to share one right. example that right. uh, only not far from right. the city where right. Uh, we have Islamic microfinance program, right. which is helping not just microfinance, we okay. give them uh, to start their businesses, but we right. provide them with the trainings right. that they can start their businesses and develop their livelihood. Yeah. I'm proud to say that, alhamdulillah, for over 15 years of work that team is doing, we have seen increase in income of household 500 percent from Lovely. the base. Lovely. That's one of the aspect hallmark of our that you mentioned the giving fishing rod rather fish. One of the program that I visited in uh, Kashmir is right. uh, livestock where right. uh, women community organization are right. uh, raiding cows. We are helping them impart skills to a point that the prices of milk went down in that particular area Lovely. because the milk production was at that scale. Lovely. So these small uh, interventions and Lovely. small businesses are helping communities and eventually it will help society to move right. forward. Right. Uh, so, you know, we have seen, especially, you know, when I was reading the literature about the uh, community development and about the social development, uh, one of the criticism that is leveled on the NGOs or the humanitarian aid organization is that um, so there is a defined level of skepticism in the communities they were, in which they are serving. Uh, and there have been cases, you know, where their apparent purpose is very different to their real purpose they are serving there. Um, but since it's an Islamic relief organization, uh, so I, I don't think so, you know, you guys face that sort of skepticism in our communities because, you know, it is inspired by the faith and, you know, Islam is the guiding philosophy behind your work, right? Um, so I would really ask, uh, you know, about, you know, the, the composition of your donors and, you know, who can contribute towards your organization. I think it's a really good question and uh, I must say that uh, Islamic Relief uh, is going to be 40 years globally that Lovely. we are in existence. Okay. One of our core strength is Alhamdulillah right. the individual donors uh, right. either in US, in right. Canada, in Europe, right. uh, even in this country. I right. think Pakistani nations are very generous when it comes right. to contributing to causes and right. uh, one of the top nations when it comes to philanthropy. Right. We always been enjoying uh, community trust wherever right. we operate. I think one of the right. uh, feature of our work is that wherever we operate, right. we have local staff, local colleagues who know the community, who know the culture, and right. they really try to develop this trust, who we right. are and why we are here. I think one thing that I would like to mention, Islamic right. Leaf is not here to really teach them something, but we are here to support them right. to really harness their own potential because Lovely. communities, they know better Lovely. that what is the right solution. One example I would like to give when I started my career Lovely. in this beautiful province of Balochistan in 2000, right. 2001 okay. with Islamic Relief. Uh, we were working in a community where we were helping them to have a drought resistance cropping. 
In 2000, 2001, there was a severe drought in That's that true. part of the world. Mm -hmm. And Alhamdulillah, communities, they taught us mm -hmm. that these are the uh, type of crop that we should be growing because right. it needs less water. Amazing, right. subhanAllah. Right. They have the solution for the old problems. Right. All we need is to help them, to right. provide them with the right tools and provide them with the resources. And they will, inshallah, flourish themselves with the dignity. Right, uh, that's very true. And while I was going through your website in order to get some research, uh, I came across, you know, uh, you guys are also focusing on the gender justice and climate change. Uh, and of course, you know, when we talk about the climate change, women are one of the, I think, marginalized groups when it comes to that, you know, who are disproportionately affected by the climate change. Um, so, for example, a lot of women, especially in the urban areas, and I was going through some research, and it said 72% of the women are the one who are going to get the water, fetch the water for their families families, right? Um, and especially considering the fact that if their male members have left for some sort of job search um, and, and they have migrated from their community to some other place, um, also this is the sole responsibility of the women to, you know, get the water, or to look out, you know, for entire family when it comes to that. Um, so definitely, you know, um, the climate change has a very disproportionate effect uh, on the gender, right? Um, so I would really want you to talk about, you know, your conception of the gender justice and how do you see the climate change in it, in this equation and the intersection of these two, I think the pressing problems of 21st century. I think uh, gender justice, you rightly mentioned, Islamic leaf, Alhamdulillah, we are pioneering, uh, really bringing what Islam says about the rights of women right. and uh, and making it globally a right. uh, campaign where we really right. want to put out what is the right, right. status of women in Islam. Right. One of the things that we do in our community work that we do a proper need right. assessment where we speak to all segment of society when it right. comes to any particular information. One of the example right. I would quote our program in Blochistan, right. uh, which is a win mill generated water pumps Lovely. so the ground water level was really going down it's right. difficult to use these hand pumps right. and we noticed that women children they were using even camels and donkeys right. to uh, bring water from right. as far as three to four kilometers right. it's too much of a journey That's in true. scorching sun especially in the summer where this part of the world they get 50 plus celsius temperature right. so we came up with the solution of using wind which is uh, plenty in Balochistan to get the water out from 90, 100 plus feet down below the ground. Right. And this is really changing lives. So right. we are bringing solar with this wind that's helping further communities mm -hmm. with their protection and with their having a longer hours because they right. can use uh, the light bulb more hours in the evening to do their uh, household chores. I think the other aspect of uh, climate change that we have experienced uh, in women, for example, the water check them. You mentioned that water yes. is going uh, to go away in the sea in Pakistan. That's we don't true. have these water check dams to really That's hold water true. and yes. use this for irrigation purposes. Islam right. Leaf is also uh, working in Balochistan right. and part of uh, KPK, hopefully soon, right. inshallah, where we are having these small dams. Right. We have seen recent flood that these small dams are actually helping to get the intensity of water down. Right. Uh, our team was out there yesterday in parts of Balochistan, Noshki, Pishin, Kila, Saifullah, right. where we have seen that these flood protection dams and flood right. protection walls are really helping us right. uh, to uh, protect communities uh, in the flow of the flood, uh, flash floodings. Right. So uh, I think we do have, you know, your activities documented where you are also, you know, working on it. Um, and, you know, you mentioned the gendered aspect of it and your organization is working on that, on, you know, uh, the gender justice concept of it. Uh, so, sir, why do you think, you know, it's important to address the gender justice concept? Um, that too, particularly from the lens of uh, what do you call Islam? Um, and, and you guys have uh, particularly addressed that into your website. So you, would you like to elaborate for our viewers um, out there? I think uh, it's something that is a, sometimes a misconception and right. uh, misinformation about uh, women's rights in Islam. And right. uh, we felt that as a global organization, right. we need to really take it out and share with the world. And this is what the journey over 10 years ago we started to bring this campaign with the help of all our organization, international organization in the UK, in US, Canada, in Europe. So to really work together and see that what are the real teaching of Islam in right. when it comes to women, children, right. their protection. 
And some of our programs, for example, are right. really promoting this in communities when we talk about not only in Pakistan, but in Africa and Middle East and right. elsewhere. Right. And we are committed to have these gender-based program to raise right. awareness right. Uh, that why it is important to address those uh, right. misconcepts that are prevalent in our society. That's lovely. Um, and, you know, as you mentioned that, you know, you guys are really helping out in Balochistan. Um, and, you know, uh, so so what sort of, you know, community setup is there? Um, you know, because I think the engagement of the local community is extremely important if you want to empower them, if you want to address their humanitarian needs uh, when it comes to that, considering the fact that there is a complete collapse of the communication lines, you know, um, there is no electricity. Uh, and I was reading the news. Um, I, I mean, you cannot communicate via telephone, via mobile, via internet. Um, so, you know, if someone wants to volunteer with your organization, so what is on the way forward? Can you please elaborate on that? I think one of the things on community, you mentioned rightly that Islamic Leaf, we operate by having a mobilization within the community. So right. when we work with the community, we set up, uh, we help them to set up a community organization. Right. So where we uh, try to give them this sense, we are only here, as I mentioned earlier, right. to provide them with tools and means. They will right. be the one doing uh, all the relief work themselves. Right. Alhamdulillah, I think Balochistan, we have seen the fruit of this approach. Right, we are right. doing this flood time. Community volunteers are organizing themselves uh, where they are communicating locally with staff in Balochistan and they are identifying the needs area where they need water, they need shelter, they need health care. Right. And uh, Islamic Leaf teams with the collaboration with the Provincial Disaster Management Authority, with the Line right. Ministries, the Ministry of Climate Change, right. they're really making sure that they get the relief out there where Lovely. they're getting this communication. I Lovely. think this structure is really helping to address right. the needs of right. flood affected communities. So, so you do a saying that there is already structure in place and you guys utilize that in order to, you know, help Absolutely. out people out there. Uh, lovely, you know, so let's talk about some of the challenges, you know, which you guys face while delivering the aid or in the humanitarian assistance. Do you want to delve into that? I think one of the challenges I must say is uh, Islamic Leaf, our uh, always slogan is get hard to reach areas right. and be first on the ground. Right. Always right. I say to my team right. and uh, it comes with challenges. When you mentioned then when you have road cutoffs and uh, you true. can't get to some of the, some of the areas are right. uh, dangerous to be, but right. uh, I think Alhamdulillah our volunteers and staff member, they put themselves at the front line when they see sufferings of children, women, elderly, what right. they're going through. I think yeah. this is obviously the foremost challenge. The second challenge, right. uh, I would say that sometime uh, we want media to really help us right. to really project the suffering of communities. Right. I think during this flood, I must say right. that probably we need more media coverage That's of true. people that they need this help right. so that we can get it out to our donors globally right. uh, and get and seek assistance from them. I think this will be a challenge where I will say in, in, in the context of Pakistan flood. Right, lovely. Uh, so also, you know, you talked about, you know, that there's not enough sort of media coverage on such kind of, you know, flood activities, you know. Um, and I do feel that, you know, social media springs into action and there are a lot of people, you know, who are actually sharing the organizations, you know, which can actually help people out who are adversely affected by the floods. Um, so you are here and you are here for the you know, assessment of the situation. So can I ask you, you know, what is your assessment about the floods? What needs to be done and you know, how bad it is? I mean, we know that it's pretty bad, um, but you know, as a, someone you know, who's uh, overlooking such kind of things and activities, so what is your organization uh, assessment about it? I think one of the things I must say that, uh, Alhamdulillah, Pakistani nation, we always prevail. Whatever uh, whatever nature is throwing at us right. or whatever, is, yeah. we are resilient, Alhamdulillah. Yeah. And I think uh, yeah. we know that uh, the Kashmir earthquake, famous earthquake and uh, yeah. what happened, I think, inshallah, we will prevail. And one right. of the things that we've been discussing as Islamic Relief, and I'm here with my right. team, uh, discussing about not the immediate needs, right. but what next. And as we mentioned about dignity at the beginning, we want to really rehabilitate livelihoods, right. their shelter, schools, right. health care. Right. I think we want people to have their dignity back, not just rely on right. the food assistance or on the shelter they're providing. And right. I will appeal all the agencies right. and the government department right. to have this in their planning. Because right, that's, that's what true. we need for them, not just the immediate first phase that we all that's are embarking true. upon. 
That's true. That's lovely. You know, so you are you know looking you know um, on, on the broader aspects of that. You know, which which comes after the I think post rehabilitation when it comes to that community building and, and stuff like that. Um, so uh, I do believe that you know our government is engaged in finalizing a climate change gender action plan. You know, which will address the food insecurity, which will address the agriculture, water and sanitation, and the women issues. Um, so. Um, what your organization, you know, is it working with the government in collaboration with that? Because I do see that, you know, both of your uh, interests intersect over, over this domain when it comes to that. I think absolutely. We have a strong partnership with the Ministry of Climate Change and Environment agencies where we've been collaborating right. globally as well. Right. Uh, we've Lovely. presented uh, Pakistan and the challenges in right. Pakistan in global climate change conferences only happened in last year in uh, Glasgow. And one of the things that right. we said that we need to join hands right. uh, with the government and really support the program. I think right. uh, what we need now to right. do as a community, as an individual, right. that we have to keep in mind in every intervention right. when we are building, for example, a school right. or a home, it has to be flood resilient. Right. That's lovely. And uh, lastly, I would, you know, take the last message, you know, for people, you know, who will actually want to help out uh, the flood affected victims. Um, what do you have to say about it, you know, as a CEO of your organization? I think uh, I would say that, as I said, generosity of this nation is amazing, mashallah. I've been to many countries. It's not that it's my country. It's very close to my heart. Right. I think people who want to contribute to it, please right. do get in touch right. with the provincial disaster management authorities, right. organizations who are operating. I'm not just right. saying the Justice Islamic League, but I think there are many good organizations out there right. who are providing assistance, and they can really take the relief where it's really needed. Right. Uh, that's, you know, so lovely and inspiring that, you know, uh, the, the people out there who are helping and uh, other people out, you know, who are downtrodden, who are marginalized. And especially, you know, I would really like to thank you, sir, for coming to our thank show you. and for inspiring, you know, so much goodness and, you know, for doing so much humanitarian work. Uh, and, and we're really proud, you know, that the, it's the Muslim based faith based organization, Islamic Relief, which is coming out there. Um, and we are distressed um, about the flood related affected victims out there. Um, so we would like to, you know, um, sort of wrap up this segment and, you know, then after a short break, we will move to another segment with a very interesting guest. So good morning.
welcome back and it's lovely to be back again. So we were talking about how there are actually people who are contributing towards, you know, humanitarian aid and, you know, who are actually giving out to the humanity. Uh, and there are some other people, you know, who are contributing in their own capacity towards, you know, building the image of Pakistan. And I also feel that this is sort of a, also a social work um, that we need to put down out there because, you know, um, Pakistan is our country and we love it a lot, right? Um, so we are going to talk about a, a very lovely vlogger that we have from the UK and she's documenting the beauty of Pakistan. Uh, and she had a very interesting take on, you know, what does our society and culture is all about. Um, so I'm very lucky that I've been joined by Miss um, uh, Sobia Qureshi, who happens to be a vlogger from UK. Assalamu alaikum, ma'am, and thank yeah. you so much. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much for coming to our show. So, uh, it's all it's, my honor, yeah. So, yeah, I would really like to start that how did you even venture into the field of vlogging? Well, uh, in UK, uh, right. when, when there was a COVID breakdown, right. uh, there was the first lockdown, and there right. was immediately after a few months, there was a second lockdown. Right. It affected more mental health of many people right. and it includes me right so um, so at that point I started right. doing vlogging right the only places we could go is free parks oh. so I started making vlogs of uh, interesting parks and the places right. uh, people can visit for free right lovely so later on, I uh, started uh, going doing international once the right. flights were open yes. and uh, we could travel. Right. Yeah. Um, again, that's very lovely, you know, and, and you're talking about it, uh, about, you know, vlogging and documenting stuff. Um, and I do remember that I had a family friends in UK and uh, there was a, you know, very sort of very strong or strict lockdown in the UK. Um, and, and alhamdulillah, we didn't have it there, you know, so we introduced the concept of the smart lockdowns, you know, at that time. Um, so I do believe that, you know, you went to Okara and you documented their village life. Uh, so you, do you want to talk about your experience there? You know, how did you feel? that culture was and um, uh, yes you know. uh, I have uh, uh, some friends family friends uh, they live in Ankara and Lovely. they told me that whenever you visit Pakistan do right. we do visit we just visit us right Lovely. so um, I went there and I stayed with them right uh, it's a small town right and I was amazed by how people living a simple life can be right. happy right. adaptable right and they are just they're not complaining right. and all they want uh, all they were focusing about their children to have a better right. education so right. they can do well in in their life right right yeah and that's really lovely because you know i do recount that when i went to uk um and and you know to do the europe and one thing you know that was a common defining feature you know and that didn't really really touch my heart was that um of their philosophy of living alone so i mean they are living in a high skyscraper high-rise building in apartments alone um they're going to their workplaces they're earning money they're engaged in this race of you know um you know materialistically getting better and better I do feel you know somehow the Western society has lost the meaningfulness you know the purposefulness when it comes to that um, and uh, you know so, so you know very primordial sort of things for example living in a community it makes you happy um, interacting with nature makes you happy uh, and having a pet you know or loving it or you know I mean giving food to the pet it makes you happy sort of that right um, so how did you feel the two culture uh, about you know the, the western culture and our eastern Pakistani culture about it you know so what is your take on that in UK, because right. I've been living there for a very, very long time, right. there is isolation. That's true. The life is is in a fast pack. You know, people, they are rushing to go to work. Right. And to reach work, they have to leave home one or two hours early. Right. And then when they finish, they finish late. And then again, right. it's a one or two hours traveling time. Right. So everyone is in a stress. That's they true. live in a stress. They don't have time. Even if they want to, they don't have time to social life. Right. They depend on weekend. And on the weekend, they, all, they have their own pile of work to do. Yeah. And because of the way of living there, right. uh, everybody is, there's individuality. That's true. That's why there's a depression, isolation. Every other person has a mental health problem. That's true. But I love li living in Pakistan. Yes. 
and especially when there's a joint family system right. everyone is there in sorrow happiness right. grief they fight right. they live right they kill each other <laughs> right <laughs> but end of the day they eat together right. they love each other right and That's like true. when you fight with someone it means that how much do you love it right right but the someone is here all the right. time with them that's true mm. uh and i do feel that you know you talked about depression and anxiety and that's why you know their wellness models are collapsing and they're looking towards the east um especially you know so you would find that there's a great attraction of yoga meditation and 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 these are the the wellness models from the eastern societies um now coming back to the tourism so i believe that you know you are here for you know documenting pakistan's yes. the worst landscape so can i ask you where you have been and what is your future plan for that matter uh i rec- i i have been in islamabad right lovely and uh, and then i went to kara right and on sunday i'm traveling to gilgit hunza okay uh i think that's a one week tour right and then when I, when i come back then right. i'm planning to go for to other regions right and let's see where it takes me right i don't have any like fixed program like right. i'm going there and there right wherever it takes me okay that, <laughs> i'll go okay that's <laughs> lovely so you know you are an international traveler right you like traveling yeah. um so what do you think is is traveling always very expensive or you need to be smart you know if even if you do not have that much amount of money but you do smart tourism smart traveling you can travel and you know observe a lot of civilization yes of course it's um, it's a two ways <clears throat> uh for me uh right. i my traveling is not a sponsored one i right. self finance myself right by profession i am a tutor i am a college lecturer right so i work whole year right. then i save money and then go then i go for traveling right but then again you have to be smart right don't go on a se- on don't go on a peak season when right. the tickets are very high That's accommodation true. is very high That's true uh but then again you have to plan before right. you're leaving right uh thank you so much ma'am you know for putting out so wonderfully about you know the traveling and about you know um how you know it i always say it you know um broadens your horizon traveling and thank you so much ma'am for coming to our show it's lovely thank to have you thank you very much here. for inviting me right mm-hmm. um and to wrap up this segment you know i always say that you know you need to travel because you know travel broadens your horizon you meet different people different civilizational you know the uniqueness in different civilizational as um i'm so we were talking about about it and the things that you adopt and things that i- inspire you and and you know the bad things that you do not want to adopt you all get that from traveling and i always advocate traveling and and i don't think so that you need to have a lot of money in your pocket in order to be a traveler smart traveling can take you a long way um so with that we would wrap up our segment and our show um and until next time we'll come back again with a good episode with good guests with good research until then it's a goodbye so good morning